This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Insights to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. How often do you wake up and wonder, how are we going to find the right people to help us run this company? With all the ways to find recruits, what are we going to do? To answer that question, Ira Wolf. Ira, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Joel. Great to be here. And I've heard that question way more times than I should. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you know, we we all thought uh, in uh, in the late '90s when they invented uh, Monster and these other big companies that recruiters were dead and and there'd never be a need for brokers ever again uh, for houses, travel agents, recruiters, whatever all the things are that brokers broker. Uh, we never thought there'd be a need for another one, and that just has not turned out to be true. No, absolutely. Uh, technology has been phenomenal. Uh, Monster was certainly, uh, and Career Builder, and a few others were certainly revolutionary at the time. Disruptive, I won't say revolutionary, but certainly disruptive. And uh, as we've always heard, uh, every piece of technology is going to throw, you know, be the end of an industry and throw people out of work. And it uh, sometimes that happens, but usually it's there's an evolution of that. But it tends to uh, technology really up until this point has been a tool. It's been an aid, and for recruiters, uh, for HR, for business owners, uh, it's you know if people used it properly, then it became uh, you know an assist. Uh, when they used it to replace a bad, you know, it's the same way. Here's here's what I here's what I remember, and we'll we'll fast forward here to current times here shortly. But what I remember from the late '90s was uh, I placed an ad for somebody. I needed some help. I, we needed to hire some people, and we put an ad, and at least 500 resumes came through, and and we were completely overwhelmed. We 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 I didn't even know where to start. I mean, our, our, the team didn't even know what to do. So many people had applied. So the technology did a wonderful job of getting a lot of fish into the barrel. But then we had more work than ever to do to figure out which was the right one for us. Right. And, and all those things created other opportunities. So I'll even take a step back. Uh, be, even without Monster, what, would hap- what happened was email. I mean, email was before that. So people would open up their inbox and then we had, you had people faxing resumes, you had people mailing resumes, and then all of a sudden you had emails and they go, wow, this is great. And all of a sudden you opened up your inbox and you had hundreds of those. Uh, Monster said, we're going to go one step further. We're going to make it a little easier. We're going to connect. We're going to be the matchmaker for candidates and companies. And that's what that became. But all it was, all Monster was, was an electronic job board. Uh, what it did was it it replaced the Sunday newspaper in the past. It was Thursday or Friday. You said, oh my God, somebody just sanded in the resignation. Uh, we need to post and can you get the ad, can you get a job posted in the Sunday paper so everybody sees it and by Monday or Tuesday you had applications coming in. Um, that same some people still think of that, of job posting, of recruitment in that way. And that's that's one of the problems. That's why I wrote my book, Recruiting in the Age of Googleization. That's why people have created, they're making a living now helping people because people are still using that email. They're still using, a, they're, they're still using job boards beyond the monsters uh, as they used to do it 20 years ago. But during that time, uh, in when Monster and Career Builder, even in the early 2000s, came out, uh, we had we were still on dial up. Half, half the country, or more than half the country, was still using dial up. That was that was uh, that kind of ended. It seemed to me like in either the very early 90s or the late 80s, one of the two. I yeah, some some well, again, it depends where you were. If you were in the city, um, it was. If you were dealing with us uh, lower. Uh, you know, I can't say in, in yeah, rural maybe, America, maybe more rural yeah. places. Yeah, but there are people that were hiring in rural places as well. I mean, so broadband is still a problem in, in half the country. But you're right. So if, if we took when did these things started to come into being, 
Um, we, we still had part of the country on dial up, but even if we had internet, uh, what we were on 2G or 3G at that point, um, we still had problems with bandwidth. We couldn't, we couldn't promote using videos. Uh, those were exceptions. So, but we also didn't have, I mean, the, the iPhone, the, the mobile phone really wasn't introduced to the smartphone, wasn't introduced in 2007. The tablets weren't introduced in 2010. And even then we had trouble with, with getting people online. Not everybody had equal access to the tools that were being used. So companies had people applying online. They had people applying on their website. They had people using a fax machine. I still have clients that call me that are using fax machines. Um, it's, I mean, it's crazy, but they exist. And that's part of the problem is top talent. And again, especially with the companies that you're dealing with that are looking for top talent have to be at the top of their game. And there are certain candidates uh, that have access to the job boards, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're top talent. It just means they can do a quick apply. They can put their resume up one time, hit quick apply, and apply to 100 companies in a second. And yet the companies on the receiving end aren't equipped because the applicant tracking systems and the software and the HR check that was designed basically on the premise, on, on, on the infrastructure that was around in 2010, most of these uh, application tra uh, tracking systems are, they've been improved, they've been modified, they've, they've been, uh, you know, th the technology is certainly a lot better. But the reality is, it's still based on how people applied for a job in the 1990s. So you started out by asking about Monster. Is people still consider is, well, Monster doesn't work, CareerBuild doesn't work. What do you think about ZipRecruiter? What do you think about Indeed? Um, People don't go to Indeed first. Top talent doesn't post their job on Indeed because they also know that they will be inundated by every company in the world looking for them and sending them information. So top, there's still a behind the scenes. There's still networking. There's still ways to use technology. There's people, there's people that, that just as in sales, you can identify where your top recruits are. Where are those people? They're using data. HR has notoriously been bad at using any type of data. They collect the data, but they don't do anything with it. So where, where did you find the last candidate? How did you find that last top candidate? We know that about customers. We know what works. We know what triggers. We know what they respond to. We know how long they last on a, on a landing page. A job listing is a landing page. HR and most recruiters don't track that. You know, that that's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm very focused on marketing and selling related things, so I always think about those things. But HR isn't doing those things. I, I'm on panels with top, I mean, with CEOs of HR tech companies, and we were on a call the other day, a roundtable. There was about fifty of us, and uh, some, I mean, some people that are a lot smarter than me on the call. And you know, the joke is, uh, HR doesn't know how to spell SEO. Uh, they, and that's, that's, that's what know, I, go ahead. Sorry. It's, it's not, uh, you know, I haven't really ever thought about it. I mean, I, I really never thought about uh, tracking uh, the origin of employees, the way you track the origin of a customer. And, and, you know, just because I've never thought about it, cause that's not really the side I work on, but boy, that makes a lot of sense. But you assume, but it, but and here's the problem, and I, I share this with the CEOs and the executives and and everyone that's out there. The assumption is is that HR is doing it, or or hey, it's we we posted a job on the website, and therefore we we assume marketing or or who's ever responsible for your digital marketing or social media is utilizing that, but they don't. I mean, there's a disconnect between marketing. And recruitment and recruitment is marketing. It there is there is no difference. So, oh yeah, yeah. And, and in a lot of what I, I, I last not twenty twenty, but in twenty nineteen, I spoke at like twenty seven, twenty eight conferences. And I part of what I did differently was not talking about methodologies, and it wasn't talking about concepts and strategies. I was talking about down in the really down in the roots. Uh, basics of here's how you serve a a job posting is a web page. It's a web page. It, it it could be a product. It could be a service. It could be your homepage. But it's a web page. What do you put on a web? How do you design a web page? 
What's your keyword? Do you know how many job postings the only place that the job that the keyword is the job title right at the top? It's never ever mentioned in the rest of the body of the job. It's always this job requires this job does that. Uh, but well, let's, let's let's come let's come back and we'll, we'll dissect the uh, we'll dissect that in a minute. But I want to I want to just finish up this history lesson because. I think the uh, in the way that this business has morphed, uh, and and this year in particular, uh, with the pandemic and everything else that's happening, uh, it seems to me like uh, recruitment has changed by an order of magnitude. Maybe, uh, maybe a bigger change in that industry than almost anything else that I've seen, and that's because of the work from home phenomenon. Now companies are not uh, restricted to local candidates. Oh well, you're well. There's a couple things here. So one is you're absolutely right that 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 model that we had to hire locally, we had to have we had to relocate people, we had to have people come into work, we had to have people come for an interview. All that went out the window. Uh, so immediately, what we've been talking about for years in the business is that why don't you do more video interviews? Uh, and it was, uh, well, we don't have the same feeling and we don't have that connection and we need to watch the body language. Well, all that overnight within days changed and people have adopted that. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way there was. Well, because that, that excuse is dead. <laughs> all, all those, you know, all those excuses. Uh, they, I mean, listen, is it kind of better to be in person? I kind of prefer to be in person, but is it, uh, is it 85%? Yeah, it's it's eighty five percent okay to do it uh, this way. But you have to fly across the country to have an interview for an hour or for two hours. No, no, no. no. Well, I guess so. Now, I guess it depends. I mean, maybe if it was the most senior level executives, they'll still doing that. You know, and they're gonna they're gonna take the people out. They're gonna play golf with them. They're gonna have dinner with them. They're gonna be doing all the different things. You don't know. You don't need to do that from the beginning, right? For medium level people, it may be not necessary anymore. But it used to go from a phone call. We'll have a, 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 did you talk to the person? There was a phone call, you checked them out. And then, well, why don't we schedule you to come out? So, no, so now there could be video calls and there could be more extensive video calls. There can even be a panel of calls. And then, you, but you may not want to make that final decision without having that in-person connection. So I agree, there's, there's going to be some hybrid of this, uh, but for many other positions, it could certainly be done uh, remotely. And it's going to have to be remotely, especially if they work remote uh, for, for a while. But so we so here's another thing, and, and I don't want to miss this because we, we go back. If you go back to the history, so Monster comes out, Career Builder comes out, it decimated classified ads for help wanted ads on, on newspapers for, for many reasons. But the way that candidates used to apply is I'm sitting at my desk or I'm a graduate and it's time to find a new job. So I put together my resume. Or I research, I, I go online or I go to the newspaper, I go to a, a trade magazine, I find an opportunity there and I can email, I can mail, I can fax, or if there's an opportunity to apply online, I can do that. There was an effort. I can do one job at a time. If I'm interested in working for your company, Bullseye, I have to, I have to take, make a commitment and take a few minutes to actually make to, to apply, to, to actually go through that function. What happened with not just Monster, but then it was the Indeeds, the aggregate, aggregators of the world where, where they pulled multiple sources in, including web, company websites, and posted the jobs in one entity so people can go there. I can now go to Indeed or ZipRecruiter or some of these other places and click one button and apply to 100 jobs. Without a without any commitment from the applicant, I go. You know, I, I, I really have never thought about that, but that changes a lot. I mean, I mean, that, that, you know, listen, this isn't what I do all day long, uh, and you know, I'm, as an employer, I mean, I'm not really paying a lot of attention to this, but I can I can totally get what you're saying that the person is not committed to you at all, and yet they've submitted hundreds, if not a thousand, resumes all over town. So by the time you talk to them, they may not know anything about who you are, what you do. Uh, or have any interest in you? Or don't apply. I mean, the fact is I, I apply to 50 or 100 companies and then companies say, you know, they applied and they reached them out and, and candidates are ghosting 
people are ghosting these companies. They're not ghosting them. They don't even remember applying. They may not even know because of that click of the button and the automation is that they actually submitted an application to you. It just went out uh, to the Ethernet and landed in some recruiter's box. So one of the important things, in addition to technology advancing, uh, is the, the process in which applicants apply for a job has changed. So it used to be, I think I'm going to look for a job. I make a commitment, I put my resume and application together, I have to mail it, and then I sit and wait to hear from the company. How it works now is, and this is especially from top talent, there's certainly a lot of people there that are, are still, um, I won't say lesser talent, but people who are less savvy or less in demand uh, are, are going to apply the old way. But talented, comp- talented top talent first says, I think I'm gonna look for a job, I'm going to do some research on the companies that might be a good place to work. So they've already done some of their homework. They reach out to people. They search on, um, you know, the glass doors and canoe news, or, or they just do a Google search. They reach out to people on LinkedIn. So they go through their network and they go, what do you know about this company? After they research the company, they then see what type of jobs are available and what are the job opportunities, which gets into employment branding. It gets into employment marketing. What's it look like if they say, I'm, if, if I say I'm interested in work looking at Bullseye, do I go to your company and I can't even find your career page? It's buried. Or is it just a series of copy and pasted job descriptions? Does it tell me what your culture's like? What's it like to work from the company? Who's my boss going to be? Do you, and then go back to something we talked about a few minutes earlier. Do you even know they landed on the page? Do you, every, if I don't know any other business site, any other site that I go to that doesn't request my email, even for an update. Would you like us to send updates about your jobs? Would you like to send updates on sales? Whatever it may be. On the HR side, on the recruitment side, very few companies collect any information from somebody until after they they hit apply. Do you have any, do you have any uh, sense about why it is that uh, they don't think of it as a marketing you know, from a marketing perspective? It's sort of, I, I guess the equation is sort of like feeling like, doc, like Dr. Fauci, you know, you preach this message to go out there and nobody, t- you know, and, and half the population doesn't listen. Uh, we've been talking about this forever. Um, I don't know. I mean, other than, uh, you know, I hear responses from uh, well, I mean, I mean, does it reflect something about the attitude of the company that employees need me more than I need them, and therefore we're not going to do anything to be nice to them? Whereas in marketing, you're you're working, working, working. I mean, I mean, is that part of it, or is it something else? There's, there's absolutely still that mindset is that if so, if if somebody doesn't respond the first time, um, you know, we reached out to them, we don't want them, uh, but you don't know if they're even getting a response. But there's also another scenario of. Uh, if people if, if people worked for you and left, there's still this scenario is we don't want them back. They may leave again. Um, that's crazy because people, you know, no, no one's going to have a career opportunity. Uh, nobody's going to stay for 30 or 40 years in a company. Somebody may have left for a different opportunity. They have they have more experience. They have more knowledge. Why wouldn't you bring the right employees back if they're the top talent? Why wouldn't you bring them back? That's some of the strongest networks to recruit is alumni from your company. Just because they left didn't mean they didn't value your company. They just found a better opportunity. Now, if you offer them a better opportunity where they are, they would want to come back. But people have this thing in their mindset. If they quit once, they can quit again. So we don't want to. Well, there, there are a lot of industries that the only way you can get a really substantial raise or a promotion is by leaving the company and then coming back. I mean, there are industries that work That's like really that. really good for morale internally. So you, you you leave the company, you come back and, and you give them more money and the person who stayed doesn't get rewarded for being loyal. <laughs> well, it's kind of a bad system, but but that it works that way in a lot of places. I mean, I know I've, I've heard over and over from people in the banking industry, for example, that, you know, you leave, you get a promotion then you come back to another company. And, and I've heard those people say you don't work for a bank, you work for an industry and, and they just jump around between. Yeah, Joel, places. A lot of that's going away. I mean, it, again, it's been slow and. And we don't talk about that, but there's a lot of companies. The transparency in salaries is, is, is one of the top things that candidates request is information about what compensation is going to be, even if it's a range. It doesn't have to be exact, but it's going to be a range. And yet there are still 
uh, well more than two thirds of all companies do not share what their compensation is because, well, what if we, we can get them for less? Um, the, the fact is, is, is top talent and even most people is they, that's one of the things that they want to know is what's my salary and compensation going to be before I waste your time and before you waste mine. Uh, so a lot of companies are, are now starting to get their act together with salary. It also had to do with diversity and equity. Um, you know, that, hey, we don't want to put a salary out there because I can pay a woman less and I can pay a person of color less. Um, I think it wasn't spoke outspoken like that way, but behind the scenes, I'll, it, it definitely was part of the decision making process. Um, hey, we can hire people of color for less money than we can people a white, a white male with the MBA. Uh, well, if, if, if that's the case, then why aren't companies full of uh, women and people of color who they can pay less? Why would they hire any uh, white men if they could pay all these other people less? That's a good question. Uh, for key roles, uh, it, it, it wasn't an, it wasn't, it wasn't verbally communicated or put in writing, but decisions were made that way. It seems to me is that, you know, large companies, fortune 500 size companies are probably more transparent than middle sized companies. Uh, who probably have more the attitude of we could probably get them for less, we can negotiate more, and you know because they're a little bit more entrepreneurial in nature. And there are some Fortune 500s. I mean, that's a big number, you know, and it fluctuates. There are certainly some of them that are are really going back to our premise of using, you know, why isn't recruitment thought of as marketing? Uh, is that they are doing a really stellar job at uh, using analytics the same way you did sales analytics. Um, they, they are using the principles, they're using the data, they're able to identify the type of individual with that they should be targeting, uh, whether from, from demographics, uh, to, uh, years of education, to the types of businesses they worked in, to, you know, to the size of their families, uh, would they be able to relocate what, what's their career path, but they're, they're far and few between. Honestly, and again, your target audience and 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 mine's even at that level and even lower. Um, they're not that savvy. They collect a ton of data, but they don't do anything with it. From a principle of, um, l- let me let me give you a model. We use the funnel like everybody else does, uh, the pipeline. And here's a simple question I ask. You know, people say how. Going back to your first question, how do we find more people? How do we find the talented people we have? And most people can say, well, we, we get a lot of applications, but only a handful of them are, are um, qualified. I then ask the question is, how many people started an application but didn't finish? And very few people know. Well, that. especially if they're coming through aggregators. I mean, they would never know that. But you're talking about something else. But then that's an aggregator problem. That's saying, well, the technology doesn't allow to do this. The abandonment rate, you know that on, yeah, on yeah, you yes. know that on your shopping cart for website. Why wouldn't you know that in HR? Because the abandonment rate is 90%. The average in the country is over 50%. Why, why is that? Is that because companies ask for too much information? Yes. It's a stupid process. Going back to the ATS, the ATS, it, so I apply on wherever I applied from. I heard that you're you have. Uh, an opening. And I click on it and I'm using a, a, a third party HR tech. And the first thing it asks me is to set up an account. Now, I've just set up an account at three other companies. Why do I have to set up an account with? Well, that, that's the problem. If you're applying directly, uh, it, it's a really inconvenient process, which is why the aggregators do well. Well, the aggregators do well, except from the aggregators, they, when you go back to the company, Oftentimes in the company, you have to open an account as well, because now they they may be using Workday or Taleo or iSIMS, uh, Applicant Pro, Preview APS. They're using, a, 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 they're bringing people into their database to be able to do that. So there's a disconnect. Now there are companies, I won't mention the name, but there are companies, anybody wants it, they can contact me. There are companies that bridge that gap that from the job aggregator 
to your ATS, to your HR enterprise system, that they that the candidate does not have to reapply in essence. But here's the other issue, is the application, going back to old technology history of it, the application that is being used was designed in 1960. Name, address, city, state. I looked at an, at most, I look at online applications. The most applications out of the first 50 fields that an employer is, a candidate is asked to fill out, does zero, has no relevance to if they're qualified for the job. Nothing. So I give all my background information, how you can reach me, my high school, you know, I, I have to give you my high school principal's name and this, the, the address of, of my <laughs> of the dean, um, references, uh, where I went to school. None of that qualifies people for the job. What it does is it sets a minimum. Why can't you ask one question? Do you have a minimum of a four-year degree? Are you licensed in the state of California or Pennsylvania or Iowa? Uh, you could ask five questions to qualify or disqualify somebody. Now, you don't hire them based on that, but by asking those minimal of five questions, that's it. You qualify or disqualified, and then you know, this is another this is another thing that marketers are good at. I mean, you know, you don't ask somebody a hundred questions in order to get them to come into your funnel. You ask them one or two questions, their first name and their email, and then you give them some stuff, and then you get them to give you a little more information. And then you give them, then you get them, and you kind of accumulate this information over time. Uh, it, it, it's very smart what you're saying because uh, if people are being turned off by this, these these ridiculous basic questions that. Uh, that 99% of the time they're not going to get the job anyway. So they've done all this work for nothing. Uh, I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. So I can go, I, I can apply for a $300,000 mortgage or insurance by, and the, they go up and basically what's your name and an email address. Um, you know, how old are you? I mean, there's five or so, you know, are you, do you have any health problems? Um, where, you know, where are you looking for a home or, or how much of a mortgage do you need? So people, these companies, finance, banking, mortgage, insurance are masters at this. Why the recommendation is follow their lead. They've done really well at, at getting, building databases, building a business, getting clients, getting the information, finding out if somebody's qualified or not right off the bat. And then if they're not, they still signed up. You still have their information. Maybe you can continue sending them information. Maybe it's another opportunity later on. Um, HR, again, I'm going to go back to something simple. How many, re, how many career sites, company websites collect an email from a candidate who visits your site but doesn't apply? Well, I think the corollary question is how many of them stay in touch with you, whether you get the job or not. I mean, you, you know, you just well, how many you respond. Just, so here, so the first for the for the first big drop off when we go through that funnel, the first big drop off is how many people started an application but didn't finish. It's huge. Now think about that from you're a marketing guy. Think about marketing dollars. If 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 you were if Amazon or any e commerce site lost 50 to, to 90% of every visitor to their site who was interested in applying, buying, but dropped out. Wouldn't that ring throw off some? Well, first of all, that, that, that means that every single uh, customer costs two to 10 times more than, uh, exactly. than, than they could otherwise. Exactly. So what does HR do saying, we need more money. We need a different job board. We need more money to for sponsored ads. We may have to hire a headhunter, executive recruiter to do this, which only raises the ante, but no one's asking how effective is the current process. Now, and and asking how many people actually land on those pages is a whole other ballgame. That's clueless. So we don't know how many people view the viewed the ad in the first place. That's a marketing problem. But going back to what I was talking about is once they land on the page, they click apply and you have their name, then it's a it's an HR problem. And the HR problem after that, the second biggest problem is that companies don't respond to the people who do apply. They go into this HR black hole. It could be days, weeks, and months or never 
until someone who 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 intentionally applied to your company gets a response. Do you think that some of these problems uh, are derivative of like legal counsel that lawyers tell you you have to do these kind of things, or or is it they just haven't woken up to uh, marketing, uh, you know, opportunities and marketing techniques and so forth? I'm, I'm going to point this finger to the hopefully a lot of people that are listening on this call that you're not holding HR accountable. If you don't hold HR accountable, if you're not asking these questions, and then there's the other part is you can't just hold them accountable. You have to give them the tools or make sure you have the right people in place. Well, and, HR and, and, is and, not held and thing, they probably have never been trained to think this way, because what you're talking to, this is a very unusual perspective. I have not heard any HR people uh, discuss this perspective. I think it's, I think it's quite, quite fascinating. And I love this. And, and actually, um, you know, I'm always looking for the inside track. The people who are uh, our, our listeners always know I'm looking for the inside track and, and the inside track is paying attention to things that you haven't been paying attention to before. So the best, smartest and fastest way to be successful in HR, find your best people, is to do some tracking, is to, you know, kind of keep track of all the metrics that the same things that marketing people would keep track of and treat your your HR process like the marketing people treat their process. But HR, this should, recruitment marketing, especially for recruiters, should be an essential skill. However, if they don't know it, why aren't they partnering with marketing or why don't they outsource it? You know, why don't you hire a, 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 you know, gig worker to assist HR with doing this. Um, so my advice to the executives on the call, to the own business owners that are on the call, is the next time you're in a meeting and you're talking about where do we stand on our recruitment efforts, is ask two questions. Do we know how many people start an application, don't finish it? And do we actually know how many people view our ads? So what's our what's our ratio between the number of people who actually see that we have a job opening, who actually start an application and start to apply. Uh, my guess is you will be appalled uh, either by the deer caught in the headlight look uh, or that, frankly, they just nobody's tracking you. That's a great place to start. Now, HR and recruiters may not know how to do that. So, so that's an entry. So given the tools to do that, though, so there, there's but ultimately, HR in most companies is not held responsible. It becomes the CFO's job or the COO's job, uh, or oftentimes um, it you know or it becomes marketing. Well, why don't you work with marketing to be able to do this? But if if HR doesn't know what to ask, if they don't know the questions to ask, marketing is also you know everybody's working you know well well over overtime these days doing things. Uh, and and here's another problem with it. People purchase an H, a, a, a HR tech assuming that that's marketing. It said, well, this will allow us to get a better reach because the salespeople told them that. But it has nothing to do with the technology. It has to do with the content you put out. So if you, if you, post, if you copy and paste your job description and, and it doesn't have any keywords, uh, it doesn't, you have no video or imagery on your site, you don't tell a story then it doesn't matter what technology you have. No one is being engaged. So people may land on your site, but there's no reason for them to apply because they're going to go to the next site that does a better job of telling their story. So what are yeah. some of the what are some of the great places that companies are advertising or, or attracting top talent? Where where are they going nowadays? Oh man. Um you know, who, who's doing well, uh, but, you know, Amazon does a, a pretty good job, you know, only because they're a big name. Um, put me on the spot here. Um, I, I can think of, uh, some small companies, which wouldn't be recognizable names. Uh, but if you, if you search, uh, there's actually a couple sites that if you go out to, if you search, um, like best career landing pages, uh, a company that does a really good job at, at aggregating these is on gig. It's O N G I G.com. Uh, they do a really, really good job at doing this. Another company that um, also aggregates some of this information is Ideal. Uh, a lot of the tech companies pull together the, comp- the, uh, the companies that have the best career landing pages. So I would look at what they're doing. Uh, you know, I, I know 
uh, when when I'm doing presentations, I, I'll I, rather than isolating some small companies, I'll show people even what Google's doing. How does Google attract the top talent? You know, they get uh, literally a hundred times more applicants than they do people that are qualified. But one of the reasons why is they have a great engagement. They tell a story. Uh, they also have a name. But you can copy. Uh, their model of doing that videos is a tremendous way to tell a story. And I don't mean a corporate video. I don't mean five minutes or 10 minutes of the CEO telling the story uh, of how the company developed. What people want to know is what's it like to work for your company? Um, it should be coming from hiring managers. Why don't people, once they apply, why is it HR's job to respond? If, if somebody has a, is, is a good candidate, why doesn't the HR manager, why isn't that put out to the HR manager immediately? And the HR manager through a, a video using things like Loom or Dub or any of these instant videos, uh, basically send a, a, or even LinkedIn, send a 30 to 60 second introductory video uh, to the candidate. Uh, welcoming them that, introducing themselves. There are so many simple things and they, they're they free, but they're just not, they're just not being yeah, done. Yeah, you know, that, that must, it, it just makes me think it must be an attitude thing that, that that we don't need to do this for candidates. Candidates work for us. We don't work to get them. And maybe, maybe there's something like that, but did you write about a lot of this stuff in your, in your recent book? The, the, the first part of the book, it has, as I share with people, the first 130 pages has zero to do with recruitment. It was about the world we were going to live in I wrote it in 2017, was updated actually in February of this year, but it was really about the change, to how technology was going to disrupt work, not just recruitment, but the workplace. The last half was, I have an acronym and it's called REACH, R-E-A-C-H. And it was a model to be able to use to find out what, what can we do better at? And REACH is, it's, I couldn't think of another word for it. So is, are you reaching the right people? Does your marketing, does your messaging uh, does your technology reach the people? The second is, once it gets there, does it engage them? Do they want to read it? Do they want to learn more about your company? Then is, what's your application process like? We talked about that before. Is it an easy process? Do I have to open an account? Do I have to fill out a long application to get there? What's that look like? That's an HR problem. The first two steps, reach and engage, happens to be um, marketing issues. That's not an eight. That's technically not HR. It's a marketing issue. Once they click to apply, now you're into the HR space. The HR space is A is apply, C is conversation and communication. You have to communicate before they finish that application. If they don't finish it, why aren't you communicating with them? Why don't you capture the name? But especially after, after somebody submits it, you need to have a conversation with them. Um, whatever it might be, even if it's thanks for your application, it'll be just a few days before we apply. Um, if you don't hear from us, here's how to reach out and then have some type of, even if it's an automated system, an auto reply system, a week later, send them another email if you haven't had a chance to do it. Uh, and then the age happens to be higher. Hiring does not stop at the job, at the job offer which is when everybody sorts it back out. It's like, I've done my job. Now it's up to the hiring manager. There needs to be an onboarding process. You can't just expect a person to sign and show up on the first day. If they show up on the first day and the manager's not there, the, the desk's not ready, they don't have a computer, now we're home. So, uh, But basically, they don't have the equipment. How do they become? You know, and, it, and it sort of seems that a great company would probably say, we need to make sure that we're uh, making sure this person wants to stay working here every single day. Onboarding is... The, the the drop the and I for, I don't remember the exact percentage because it keeps fluctuating and this year was ridiculously high, uh, but it, it was well over fifty percent of people don't make it past the ninety days and the number one reason given was two there were two reasons one is the expectations of the job were completely different than what they advertised so they 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 use a job description. Uh, well, I'll give you a perfect example. I was teaching a graduate class and they gave their final projects the other night. It was an organizational change. And one of them talked about is a distribution company and they were really, really struggling hiring people. They still tell people it's a 40 hour week, work week, five days a week, eight hours a day. Their average for the last nine months has been 11 and a half hours a day. You can't attract people at eight hours a day 
and then hold them. Can you stay three hours later to, or, or you're expected to stay until the job's done? So the, the two reasons that people quit their jobs after they've been hired quickly is one is the job that you promoted and the hiring manager told them what it was going to be wasn't the job that they showed up for. The other one was there was no onboarding or training. People weren't prepared for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and again, they were just told to follow Joel around for a couple of days and see how he does his job. That's not onboarding. People expect more. And the top companies are doing a good job at that. The problem is, is you know, it, it's a bell-shaped curve. You, you got yeah. this. Well, listen, we, I, I think we certainly need to do, uh, we need to get everybody doing a better job. And and you you certainly coughed up the inside track on on how to find these best people, which is, you know, kind of applying marketing methodology to the HR, HR function. So, uh, Ira, listen, we're, we're delighted to, that you came on the show. We're delighted to uh, have had you here today. Uh, thank you very much. We'll post your uh, uh, your availability, your, your contact information, your bio and so forth in the show notes. But thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I hope that uh, you can help some of our listeners. It's been a great opportunity. I wish everybody well and uh, lots of success in 2021 for sure. You've been listening to Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. For more insights and to learn more, visit joelblock.com. How about a shout out and a huge thanks to our podcast show producer, David Wolf, and the team at Autovita Studios. Profit from the inside wouldn't be possible without these wonderful professionals. To learn more or to find out how you can launch and produce your own podcast show, reach out to www.audivita.com. That's A-U-D-I-V-I-T-A.com.